Hello, everyone. Um, I'm I'm really thrilled to have my guest here today. He's um, a writer, producer, director, and an author too. And we'll be covering, we're talking about his books too. He's got a current one out called Homes Coming, and we'll we'll ask him about that too. But I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, the creator of the Hulk, uh, the Incredible Hulk TV series, The Bionic Woman, V, the TV series, Alien Nation, to name a few. Uh, it's Mr. Kenneth Johnson. How are you doing, Kenny? I am wonderful. Thanks for calling me Kenny Frank. That's what all of my family and friends have always called me, at least in my face, you know. <laughs> You're very welcome, Kenny. It's lovely to have you here, by the way. Um, this has been a long time in the making, actually. I think I've been trying to get this uh, sorted with you for over a year, I believe. Um, it wouldn't surprise me, but I appreciate your diligence and I appreciate your interest. And I'm I'm eager to hear what you uh, what what questions I can answer for you and uh, overwhelm you with uh, past exploits. Oh yes, yes, I can't wait to dive into it. First of all, Kenny, let's, let's start with um, uh, you did direct, you did work on some of the Six Million Dollar Man episodes. I think you directed a, a few, didn't you? Oh, well, right. that's what I did was um, uh, my my um, I had been a director for a long time and a producer director uh, and back in, in live television in New York, frustrated that I was not yet getting my foot into film, which is what I had always intended to do. Uh, and finally, I came out here and after considerable success back east, uh, I came out here and said, OK, here I am ready to do uh, movies. And uh, Hollywood said, oh, but you like working live TV and stuff and documentary. You know, I said, uh, well, yeah, and I was really frustrated because I discovered I was actually sleeping on the couch of my friend Stephen Bochco, who had been a Carnegie uh, classmate with me at Carnegie Mellon in the drama department there. And uh, uh, Steve uh, had already come to Hollywood and gotten his foot in the door at Universal Studios. And um, uh, and he said, Kenny, you should write. That way, if you write, you can you can you know actors can do bit parts and work their way up, and and writers can write on spec. But unless you're have already directed for somebody else, nobody wants to hire you to direct. So it was a a, a real catch twenty two because I couldn't. I never thought of myself as a writer. I didn't think I had those talents. Um, but uh, Stephen just bad badgered me and badgered me, and finally I just started to start start writing, and uh, uh, and I discovered. I could do it, Frank, and and I could write pretty fast and with pretty good stories, and and I became quite a prolific writer of unproduced screenplays, you know, right. which, yeah. which is the way we all start. But uh, but Steve uh, liked one of them particularly and passed it along to Harv Bennett, who was a big time executive producer at Universal. He was doing Rich Man Poor Man and a number of other major miniseries, but he had also sold this show called The Six Million Dollar Man, and they had. They were a mid-season pickup, so they'd already done about 12 episodes, but now they were just diving into their first full season and they had hardly any scripts. And uh, uh -huh. Steve gave my um, uh, my script, my screen, one of my screenplays to Harv, who really liked it, said, I can't get it produced for you, but uh, how'd you like to give me an idea for, for some $6 million man episodes? And the first thing that came to mind, of course, was The Bride of Frankenstein. It seemed like a logical thing to have a female counterpart. And uh, Harv liked the idea and uh, and asked me to write it, which I did very quickly <laughs> and in, yeah. uh, in, a, in about 10 days. And uh, uh, and they loved the script, but thought it was too dense. There was too much going on. And I said, well, I told you that you were trying to pack all this mission stuff into it. And there was also I was trying to do a love story. And he, I said, well, what do you want me to cut? And he said, oh, we don't want you to cut anything. We want you to make it longer, turn it into a two parter. I said, but you only have one hour episodes. I said, yeah, we'll do two, one hour. It was the first time anybody thought about doing a two part episode on a one hour episodic show. And I was thrilled and delighted. Uh, I said, do I get paid again? <laughs> and then, <laughs> I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, it's a whole new script, you know? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. so I did that and he liked it a lot. And, uh, and also recognized very quickly that I had a lot of producing and directing chops. Uh, he see, has gotten to see some of the other stuff that I had done and my credits and all, and invited me into the editing room with him on shows he was already working on. And uh, uh, and I was he just sort of took me under his wing and made me an integral part of the whole creation of the bionic woman and casting Lindsay and everything. Uh, and very quickly offered me a, a job as writer producer on the Six Million Dollar Man. And I, I tried to beg off and say, Harv, I'd really rather just write and direct for you. Producing is kind of a pain in the ass and you don't have time to do what I'd like to do is be on the set with my teams, you know? 
And uh, and Harv said, uh, uh, here's the story, Kenny, in television. In television, the producer is the guy that hires the writer and hires the director. Yeah. Yes. And I processed that and said, okay, that's a job I'll take. And uh, so, I, <laughs> yeah. so I joined Six Mill. There was one other writing producer named Lee Siegel, very talented guy, who, who was really overwhelmed because there were no, and he had one story editor and that was it. This was back in the day when we didn't have rooms full of writers. There were no writers' rooms then. It yeah, was yeah. for the uh, a writing producer and a couple of others, and and then you try to use <laughs> outside writers because you know you, you try to use outside writers to come in and, and help bring you ideas. But um, uh, I, I took that gig, and uh, and very quickly I I was doing like uh, every other episode. The way we laid it out was Lee would do one, I would do one, and Lee Siegel would do one, and I'd do one, and so. So we were going back and forth, and uh, and I ended up writing I think it, eleven of the twelve or thirteen episodes that I produced, and totally rewriting the other three that uh, somebody else had written, and uh, and it was fun because it's a, the great thing about doing an episodic television show, Frank, is that you know the script is going to get produced because they have to put something on the air. Yeah. And the, yeah. the universal motto was, we don't need it to be good. We need it to be Thursday. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the trick was to try to make it good and get it out on Thursday. And it was a challenging, a challenging thing. So I was uh, I was producing The Six Million Dollar Man, as, and The Bionic Woman, incidentally, went on the air, obviously became... A, a huge hit and brought, brought Six Mill up into the, really the attention of the public for the first time. Um, and then they decided they wanted me to bring her back uh, to do the return of the bionic woman. Uh, they had forced me to kill her off when I wrote my original script. Uh, I kept saying, this is a bad idea, guys. Let me just put her in a, in a freezer somewhere, you know? And they said, oh, well, we wanted to love the story. That was the big thing that year, you know, the, 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 the grieving, man who was left behind from his loved life and uh, but so i did i killed her off and then of course the uh, uh the mail began to come in about the uh from people all over the country all uh, about how they loved it and they wanted to bring 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 jamie back and the networks and, and the studio noticed that the ratings had just shot up enormously so they came back to me and they said yeah, we want to bring her back. Why'd you kill her anyway, Kenny? That was a dumb idea, you know, and that uh, was like genius, guys. So I had devised, yeah. Yeah, devised a way to uh, sort of uh, put her in a hibernation and um, uh, and bring her back. And uh, and it was a huge success that took the six million dollar man into the top 10 for the first time when we did the return of the bionic woman. And, and then immediately, ABC, Freddie Silverman decided he wanted to spin off the bionic woman as a separate series which meant, uh, and, I, and I was concerned about it. I mean, obviously you make more money when you're doing two shows at the same time, but you also find yourself living in a garbage disposal, <laughs> Frank, mm. because it's just so hard to, uh, to do one show at a time, much less two. Yeah. And yeah. particularly when, as an executive producer or, or the, 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 the showrunner on the show, uh, you don't have time to go down and direct. You know, you're too busy getting the stories ready and the scripts ready and the shows that are shooting and making sure they're shooting right and then doing post at the same time for the ones that have already shot. You know, you're like the admiral that makes sure the fleet is sailing in the right direction, but you don't have time to be the captain and be on the ship and have, fight in the battles, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so finally I let go of Six Mail and just stayed with Bionic Woman and uh, uh, and that was the right choice for me. Yeah, that's great. That's really that's really fascinating. Uh, leaping a wee bit ahead here, but not too much. Um, getting on to the the Incredible Hulk, okay, uh, which is why a lot of us are here for. Um, sure. And we get onto that in a little a little while. Um, where some of the guys were sending questions for you about the Hulk, right? But um, it became hugely popular. I mean, how it tra how it transcended to television from the comics. It was very, obviously radically different. It had to be. Um, but um, are you surprised, Kenny? Forty-five years now, we're celebrating the Incredible Hulk since the, the pilot. Are you surprised that you're still here talking about it forty-five years later? 
<laughs> I, I don't, I quite believe that it could have been 45 years ago because I'm only, I feel about three years older than I was when I started. Yeah. I, I've had yeah. arrested development at about age 25 uh, for, forever. Um, I still talking to you feel like I'm talking to a grown up here, you know, and uh, the kid in the room that uh, how do they, somebody's going to discover it's what is it the the imposter syndrome, you know? Yeah. But no, yeah. It's, it's it's amazing and and it's also wonderful and. Uh, uh, and I think that it's it's because of, of what we tried to do in the show, uh, which was to totally pull it away from comic books. I was originally offered, the, the Universal had require, acquired five of the lesser Marvel characters at the time for the ridiculous price of $15,000. That's what the Universal spent for five Marvel characters. And uh, uh, and they were, you know, sort of the left, lower echelon ones, except for Captain America. That was one that they offered me. But there were also the Human Torch and Ms. Marvel and uh, uh, a couple of others. And um, I, I just, you know, didn't want to do comic book stuff, Frank. I'd been trained at Carnegie Mellon in the classic theater. And I'd run a film society for, for four years, putting myself through school and seen four or five hundred of the great classic epics of and, and films of the cinema, and I really, you know, wanted to do serious stuff and and at least have an eclectic career, if nothing else. Um, and so I really didn't want to do uh, anything derived from a comic book. And um, and I read the I, I looked at the, the well, I was in the middle of reading uh, Les Misérables. Maybe you've heard that story. At the time, my wife Susie had had given me the book, which she read when she was about sixteen, I think. Uh, and I'd never read it. So I had Jean Valjean and Inspector Jovert pursuing him and the fugitive kind of concept in my head. And I thought, well, maybe I could take a little Victor Hugo and a little bite out of Robert Louis Stevenson and Jekyll and Hyde thing and, and this ridiculous thing called The Incredible Hulk. And so I uh, and turn it into a, a real adult project uh, about a guy who had brought down the, the curse upon himself in the classic tradition of Greek tragedy, where the protagonist messes with stuff better left to gods and the gods don't like that when you do that and so he had brought down the curse upon himself and uh and i said and it needs to be uh, a really sort of dark and uh and uh psychologically deep story um and universal liked the idea and so did cbs and uh, i and i also said just leave me alone and let me cast it the way that i want uh, and I jumped in and, and I wrote the pilot, the, the two hour pilot in seven days, actually, it was very fast. Uh, and we shot uh, the, the white pages of my very first draft and that's what it ended up on the screen. And the only actor I ever had in mind for it was Bix. Uh, I had seen Bill Bixby in a play, uh, a television play called Steam Bath uh, in 1973 uh, and in which he just was the most astonishing performer I'd ever seen. He just hit all the bases of that of the whole range that any actor could dream of having in there. And uh, uh, and I I sent the script to Bill, and <laughs> his agent told me that he, when he gave it to handed it to Bill, Bill said, "I don't even want to read a script that's called The Hulk." <laughs> And um, uh, and then his agent said, "Yes, you do." And he did. And uh, and he called me the next day and came over and and uh, to the, we'd met just casually a couple of times, but I'd never worked with him. And he came storming into my office at Universal, just like you know, rawr, when Bill came into a room, all the oxygen went out, you know, because he was just as such an extraordinary persona and personality. And he said, is this what we're really going to do? Are we going to do a psychological drama? And I'm going to suffer. You know, actors love to suffer. Frank. So it's that's important always. And uh, and it's going to be an adult theme. So I said, yeah, absolutely. That's what we're going to do. And uh, uh, and that, I think, is the part of the reason that it it's because it surprised people when it went on the air. It surprised the critics. It surprised the audiences. Uh, they were sort of thinking, well, this is going to be another comic book show, Green Monster on the Loose. And but then suddenly the adults were watching and said, wait a minute, this, this is not what we were expecting. It was right from the very beginning, uh, a very powerful drama uh, with a very empathetic uh, hero and star in, in Bix uh, that really drew the audiences in. And uh, and that's what carried us along. Our 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 largest audience group um, was adult women. 
that's the the major number of people that watch the show were adult women and then men and then teens and then kids. It's it's the ideal thing for television uh, is what they call a, a four quadrant show when you've got hit those four bases and we hit them hard, but particularly women. And in all of the work that I've done in science fiction, Frank, the, the, the female audience has always been the largest segment of my audience. And I think it has carried on uh, and maintained its popularity because of what we tried to do in terms of uh, having it have some, some real substance and some psychological depth and, uh, uh, and emotional structure. Uh, and, uh, and it's, and it's wonderful for me that I still get the same kind of emails today that I got 20 and 30 and 45 years ago uh, from people who were touched by it or saw it when they were a kid and now look at it again as, as an adult and, uh, uh, and realize how much was really going on sort of under the surface. And, uh, uh, and it's, it's incredibly rewarding to have that kind of popularity and I, it's humbling and I'm, I'm always sort of amazed that it happened that way. Whoops, I was just muting there just while you were talking there, Ken. Uh, um, yeah, it's 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 astonishing to me um, the 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 the, um, the drama side of it, the the human aspect to it, to the stories. You know, the troubled people that he met, not not the fact that he had a problem, but the people he met had a problem, and he had to kind of deal with that. Well, yeah, as well, we you know. were trying to, what we tried to do thematically was, you know, we would say, okay, what makes this a Hulk episode? Uh, why is it a Hulk episode as opposed to an episode of some other show? Uh, and it was because the, the theme, the underlying theme was really self-control, was really how to control the raging beast that dwelled within him. But we, in Dr. Banner, his demon within was anger. But with other people, it could be alcohol, or it could be drugs, or it could be obsession or it could be greed or it could be you know so we tried to make the episodes as much as we could uh, could manage about something a, a writer would might come in and uh, and start telling me a plot line that he had in our story I say no 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 don't tell me the story don't tell me the plot tell me what it's about you know yeah and yeah. Uh, one of the most popular ones that that people always tend to comment on is uh, about the the abused woman and child uh, that uh, Banner got involved with, because when I when we wrote the script, CBS said, no, we don't want to do this. This is not a Hulk episode. I said, what are you talking about? They said, well, there are no bad guys. And I said, oh. I said, guys, don't you see the parallel, the allegory that we're working on here? How the, the, the creature beating up on a human is like the human beating up on his kid or his wife. And, uh, uh, and they fought me and fought me. And I said, listen, I'm going to make this if you don't want to air it fine, but this is the show we're going to do. And of course, that's one of the ones that won so many awards and, and still people talk about today when they look back on uh, on what we did. Also, I wanted to bring up something that I've, I've been curious to know about. I don't think, I'm not sure you've ever mentioned it in an interview before, Kenny, but I'm going to, I want to ask you anyway, because it's been puzzling me this. Um, in the episode called Terror in Times Square, um, which uh, which was credited to on screen to direct, uh, Alan J. Levy, I believe. I'm curious because I've seen some snap, uh, sort of behind the scenes shots of it. There you are, directing Lou running along Times Square. So I wondered. I'm curious to know how that happened. Where you switched, to, you came in to just direct those sequences rather than Alan. Well, because I um, uh, I knew what I wanted to get, what I was trying to do, this was one of the very early episodes, and what I was trying to do was to make it believable that this big green guy with that ridiculous wig that we never could get right uh, was running around in the real world, you know, and and that's and this was the the the, the whole challenge of doing the whole uh, concept and the piece, Frank, because. Um, it, it's an unreal character, and it, it was a comic book character, and I and I, I was doing everything I could to try to uh, invest with real world values in it. Um, that's part of the reason I changed his name from from Bruce Banner to David Banner because I hated that uh, 
comic book trope of alliterative names, you know, Lex Luthor, Lois Lane, Clark Kent, Peter Parker, you know, and all that. And, uh, and Stan understood that when I told him what I was trying to do. And Stan understood also that it had to be different to live in the real world and to work as a drama that adults would come to. We had to make it live in the real world as much as we possibly could. And so when we uh, we started putting the scripts together, I went to Frank Price, who's head of Universal, and I said, "Listen, the part, the most real part of the real world that everybody in the in the world knows is Times Square." Frank, I said, "I, I want to run him through Times Square," and uh, Frank said, "This is a great idea." And Alan was directing the the uh, the episode uh, itself, but. Uh, uh, and and I said, okay, I will take Lou and we will go and do, I'll pick up a very small crew in New York. We'll take our makeup people with us, obviously. And uh, and we just shoot for a day. Uh, it was a very, very cold day in March. And, um, uh, and, uh, and so it was just me there directing that piece. I didn't bother to put my name, uh, you know, as the co-director or something like that. And Alan was doing the show and that's what was fine with me. Uh, Alan was a wonderful director. There's a lot of episodes for me also on the on the bionic woman and a great friend uh, always too um so uh, i he and i worked out what he would be able to do on the back lot on, on new york street at, uh, at universal studios to tie in with what i was going to shoot on broadway and also on park avenue we also ran him up park avenue uh and so it was a just a very cold day in march when running down broadway with the police behind us to make sure we didn't get killed <laughs> Uh, and, um, uh, and I, you know, I was curious if anybody would even notice in Times Square, because it's so freaky in Times Square, particularly back in the 80s. But uh, so there's Lou uh, in his freezing and his with just a shirt dangling on him running down Broadway with the Steadicam operator running behind him and me running behind the Steadicam operator looking at his monitor, making sure we're getting the shot. Um, and, um, uh, and it was a... Uh, uh, it was great because the, the, the there was a thousand extras around us, of course, in every direction, and people were looking at him, as of course they would be if he really was running down. And we got a couple of shots from the top of time of the Times, uh, the building in Times Square where the globe where the globe comes down, so I could really put him in the middle of the real world, you know. And that's what I was trying to do. And uh, and then Alan uh, and I sat down together, and I showed him the stuff that I had done, and uh, and how we would would, would arrange the uh, shooting that he had to do that would tie into it, so that it would be seamless. Um, and it's funny because the the I had I had been struggling. Stan Lee and I had had a disagreement about the second two hour movie that uh, uh, that we did. I I originally did a two hour pilot, uh, and there was an agreement with CBS that we would do a second two hour movie. The first would be my Genesis pilot, how that how it happened and the story got started. The second was a two hour movie that Alan directed, actually, um, and uh, because I was busy doing Bionic Woman still at the time. Uh, and in the script for the the second movie, I wrote a fight with a bear, and maybe you've heard the bear story. I don't know, but uh, uh, just very quickly, uh, Stan read the script and he, he didn't give us any uh, any big notes ever about the scripts. He just said, "You know what you're doing, Kenny. Go do it." But he said, Look, I love the bear. The bear is great. It's such a cool thing. But, you know, Kenny, it ought to be a robot bear. And I said, no, Stan, you see, let me explain. <laughs> you know, we, we, you, you, we're asking, an, you can't ask an adult audience to buy that much. You know, we're asking them to buy that Bill Bixby metamorphoses into Lou Ferrigno, and that is a really big buy. And if you add a robot bear, Stan, you know, but he said, but you did a robotic, a robotic, big, a bionic Bigfoot kind of thing. I said, yeah, but that was on a show where we were in the world of robotics and, or, and cyber organisms and all this is not where we are with the Hulk. We're in the real world, and we got this big green guy running through it. And um, uh, and he's you know, and we had gone around and around. And when we broke for lunch while we were shooting in New York that day, Stan's office was just a block over on Sixth Avenue. And I said, I, I, I got to go over and settle this issue with him because it was still sticking in his you know, craw. And um, uh, and I went in to see him, and he came steaming out of his office like Stan steams in, like Bill does, <laughs> and said, "Kenny, Kenny, did you get the letter I sent you?" I said, "No, what, what, what?" And he said, "I sent you a letter saying you were right and I was wrong. No robot bears, not real, doesn't work. Just do what you're doing." So it was, it was, it worked out fine from there on. That's brilliant. Yeah, I, I remember that that bear thing was. Um, yeah, it was. It's, 
gone down in history that one um, with that, the green the, paint the other, coming you, off. Uh, um, from well, the, yeah, the green, the other. Yeah, yeah. Whenever, whenever that was a problem, we were still in the first two movies. We were using grease paint because uh, there was no green pancake makeup, uh, and you had to have grease paint. And you rubbed in, you bumped into Lou, and you got green, blue, green all over you. And that the same thing happened with the bear. Uh, we every time he'd get in a fight with a bear, and then they'd split up. Poor the bear, whose name was Pooh, incidentally, it was Pooh Bear. Uh -huh. uh, Pooh, Pooh, Pooh would be uh, Pooh would be all green, and the funnier part is that I have a red green uh, black color blindness oftentimes, particularly when it's close to brown. Uh -huh. And in the day, in the dailies, everybody around me is laughing about you know what are you laughing at? And he said, "Well, look at the bear." I said, "What about the bear?" He said, "He's green." I said, "He is." Oh, okay. <laughs> it was challenging, but we had a good time. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. Uh, right, Kenny, I've got some um, questions sent in for you about okay. The Incredible Hulk. Um, so we'll get to those, and then we'll see how we do after that. Okay, um, right, let's see where we are. Um, oh, here we go. Right. This is from the inc <laughs> tongue twister, this. The Incredible Hulk, Luther Igno, and Bill Bixby dedication group I'm glad I wrote that down because I wouldn't remember it. <laughs> right, a good idea. <clears throat> On Facebook. Uh, and the uh, uh, the moderator of that page is Scott Fowler, so I thought I'd give that man a mention, Scott, there. Hello, Scott. And uh, he runs it really well. Uh, so the first question is from Stephen Gallagher, and he asks you, how was the ding transformation sound um, achieved for the Hulk outs? <laughs> Um, when we did it, we did it in the, um, uh, well, I, one of the things that was not in the comic book, uh, I mean, basically all I took from the comic book was gamma, a little bit of gamma, something or other, and, uh, and he turns green, which I didn't agree with. I said he should be red because that's rage is red, but yeah. Stan didn't let me, he let me change his name, but he wouldn't let me make him a red Hulk until they did later on, <laughs> you know, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I wanted a trigger mechanism so that uh, when we saw the white eyes, that's why I, I said, let's use the white eyes. I had used them actually on, on the big Bigfoot uh, uh, when I did the $6 million man episode and it's very creepy. And uh, and when they when the white eyes came in to the makeup department, um, I remember I sent Bill down to go try them on. We were sitting in the middle of shooting the pilot. And, uh, and when he came back walking toward me, and he said, hey, Kenny. And I look and see Bill Bixby, this big mega television star with these white eyes and this big grin. And I thought, oh, my God, this show is going to be a hit. And uh, but I wanted a sound. I wanted I wanted a sting, a real sting. Uh, and, and it was a um, and I talked to Joe Harnell and our, our sound effects guys about it. And it was a combination of, of, uh, of sound effects. Uh, but it was also um, a really, really high springs um, kind of thing. And also I wanted human voices in it uh, so that it would have this aura of humanity about it, but still be very, very high. It was like I, I sort of used as a model the piece that Ligeti uh, wrote that was used by Stanley Kubrick in, um, uh, in 2001. Uh, when the it's on the when they're on the moon and it's the, the apes are going, uh, 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 you know, and you slowly have the and there was a very high dissonant kind of choral thing. Uh, so we we blended all of that a little bit of, of, of music, a little bit of stingy kind of sound effects, uh, and uh, uh, and, uh, and and the orchestral quality under it. and. And that's what we did. Uh, and we had to find a cheaper way to do it for, for the series because uh, when you're using a chorus, they get paid like actors do because they're all part of the Screen Actors Guild. And suddenly you got to pay 10 extra people uh, if you want a, uh, you know, a chorus. Uh, so we had to try to find a synthetic way to do it with, or and it, but just using a couple of people, real humans, and then the voice... Uh, synth synthesized sound that sounded kind of human to make it work, but that's what we did. Brilliant stuff. Uh, yeah, I, it's so iconic that it's uh, that in itself that sound, isn't it? Because you know what's coming when you hear that, you know, or when you see right. the eyes, and then that 
ding, and then you go into it, you know, there's no turning well, back at that point, you know. Well, and, well, see, that's the reason, that's part of the reason I did it, because first of all, I wanted to know, ups, we're past the point of no return. And secondly, it gave me the uh, op opportunity not to have to show the full transformation every time. Once we saw the white eyes, Bix can get thrown into a closet, and we knew what was happening in there, and yeah. we knew it was coming out. Uh, but uh, on some uh, episodes, you even you don't even see that; you just hear the sound. Yes, that's right. You know, and, that's and, and but immediately you know what's going to you know what's going on. You don't need, didn't even show the eyes, you know. That's but, it. Um, but we did we did have a lot of fun finding different ways to make the transitions work. I mean, we when we did the the pilot movie, I was struggling with okay, how do I how do I expand this human being? And uh, I we tried getting uh, wetsuits, dry suits, the for dive, scuba diving that you could blow up and inflate. That didn't work. Uh, you know, we went through all kinds of uh, odds and ends until finally I said, let's just do this. Let's put a really tight shirt on Lou and have and make the seams a little weak so that we could pull the thread out at the bottom and it would sort of zip up and he could expand yeah. out and and we had to do it in cuts and and the the physical the facial transformation it was embarrassing because i mean the only technology we had at the time was the same technology that they used on the wolf man back in the 1940s mm. where you put makeup on bix and you shoot some film and then you take him away and you put some more makeup on and you shoot some more and you do a series of dissolves and blah, blah, blah. You know, there was this was decades before CGI was even dreamed of. Uh, so it was it was it was frustrating to have to try to do too many facial transitions. So, um, oh, yes, there's a question from uh, Darren Nicholson, and he asks you in the two part story called the first. Um, why didn't. <laughs> Why didn't uh, you get another bodybuilder to fight Lou rather than this tall, skinny fella? Um, well, it, it, it's interesting. We uh, Harry Towns, I believe, was the guy's name uh, who played that. And this is one of the uh, one of the two one of the one of several episodes that is always comes up the uh, the battered wife, the child, the abused child thing, and the abusive relationship, and uh, uh, and my move, pilot movie, and also the one we did with Marriott Hartley, where uh, you know, which she won the Emmy for Best Actress in a Drama Series that year for that performance. Uh, and then the big Prometheus uh, two-parter that I did later on. Those, those along with the first, are the ones that people always seem to ask about the most. And uh, uh, and and I don't honestly remember the answer to that. Uh, I'm sorry to say to Darren, uh, we I think we must have toyed with it, but it was very hard to find the the kinds of people that uh, that had the acting ability. I mean, you know, my original casting of of the Incredible Hulk was uh, Richard Keel. Who uh, was the you know a, a studied actor and really good and also seven and a half feet tall, way taller than Lou was, uh, and he was an actor uh, because I wanted, wanted somebody that would be able to really act. And Lou, you know, was twenty four years old and had never done anything other than the bodybuilding, and uh, he'd been in a couple of documentaries about that. Um, but um, I think probably what we went for was let's get the best actor we can and he can be as strong as we want him to be, but he doesn't have to be a Mr. Olympia. Yeah, I, it's um, although I must admit when I was a kid, he did scare the hell out of me. So he, he did. He was effective in that sense. You know, oh, that's, that's, exactly the, that's one thing that sticks in my nightmares was the look of him was pretty yeah. freaky. <laughs> You know? Well, and yeah, and he was a really strong actor, a wonderful guy uh, to work with. Uh, uh, a friend of his recently wrote me, who who knew him very well, and, uh, uh, and um, had let me know that he had he had passed on a few years ago. But uh, uh, but he was really terrific. Uh, and and what we you know, act the actor is the most important thing, and the and getting the the emotion out. And one of the things that uh, developed with Louis as as the show went on, I mean, here he was surrounded by a lot of great actors. Uh, including Bix, including Jack Colvin, who, uh, in addition to being an actor, Jack was a ter it was a terrific uh, acting coach and acting teacher. Yes. So yeah. uh, with them around him, he and be able to whisper in his ear and give him some coaching and some stuff. I was able to help with too. I mean, Louis just developed over the series because some of the moments that were the to me the most enjoyable and and to watch were the scenes after he had his temper tantrum and was coming down 
and and he was no longer wanting to smash things up, but uh, but he, he was still an innocent, and he was still you know outside the world, and and that way you know we could have people teach him how to open a soda can, and uh, you know and that kind of thing, and 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 and. And Louis began to really develop as an actor in, as we'd work through those scenes. And we began to write more and more of them in because it was kind of touching to, to watch this, this guy with uh, special needs uh, trying to work his way into the world. And, and Stan has often too commented about uh, uh, why I, I decided early on, Hulk not talk. Uh, Hulk talk sound dumb. <laughs> and, uh, and it would be really goofy and, and, uh, and Stan, uh, really uh, applauded that uh, a lot because he he really felt that uh, again in, in an effort to try to make it as real as we possibly could, if Hulk Town talked like that, it's going to you know sort of pull you out of the movie. I agree. I think it was a very wise move on your part to not have him speak. You know, um, Sean Sean Brosnan asked you, um, other than the. Um, well, let's see if I get see if I'm getting this right. Okay, sorry, a bit more light there. Other than the gag reel that was released, <laughs> um, that most people have seen, which is hilarious, by the way. Um, is there any other unused footage or outtakes that still exist out there, and could they possibly be released in the collection? Do you think? No, there's nothing. There was there was another uh, season of the gag reel. Uh, and uh, that somehow disappeared out of the editing room before I could grab it. And it has never been seen since. Uh, when we were doing Married, um, the, the uh, yeah, it was, no, it was, yeah. No, it was Prometheus. When we were doing Prometheus, there was there was a bunch of behind the scenes footage that, and some of it was very funny. Uh, and um, And the crew and cast got to see it. But somehow it disappeared out of the editing building, and I went up to pick it up, and it was just gone, and it's never been seen since. So, uh, but there's, I wish if anybody knows where it is, I'd be delighted to hear about. It. We all, we all would, Kenny. I tell you, yes, yeah, I know. just to get any any new things like that, you know. Right. We love things like that, you know. Oh um, yeah, well you know what it is because it because it the thing about gag reels. I mean, obviously it's funny to us, and a lot of the stuff is inside jokes that that the crew and cast would get that audiences wouldn't necessarily think. Why is that funny? Uh, but uh, but what what gag reels show you, and even the old ones. I mean, you see old uh, outtakes from old Jimmy Stewart movies. You know where he's doing something, and suddenly he's looking at the camera and going, "Oh, you're going yeah. that way. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, I got to act different." You know. And uh, and Bogart had his, and uh, and De Betty Davis, God knows, had hers. Uh, and it's fun. A lot of those you can, you can see. And it what it does is it makes some real people. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, uh, you know we had a lot from the Bionic Woman too, with Lindsay and uh, and Richard Anderson. Uh, Richard was famous for for always sometimes to get out of a scene at the end of it, he'd pick up his phone and go. Get me the men's room, you know, <laughs> a lot of stuff like that. And uh, yeah. and it's that's indicative of the kind of fun that we all had on the sets while we were doing it, because it's a it's a grueling life that's not nearly as glamorous as people often think. I, I mean, you're working 14 hour days as a norm every day for nine months in a row. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a hugely challenging thing for the actors to, uh, to just survive and, and get, the, get the lines down and get it out on the screen. Yeah. Um, I got a question from um, Paul Wells. He asked okay. you about the cancellation of the TV series, The Hulk. <laughs> um, your thoughts on that? Um, what um, had it gone on? What what did you? Did, how far did you get with any plans for episodes? Um, also, um, have you ever watched the three made for TV movies that followed it from the late eighties to the early nineties? We Bill directed a couple of those. Yeah, there were three of them. I hadn't. I was not involved with them at all. I didn't even know they were being done until they were, I, I think, finished. Uh, I was busy filming Short Circuit Two at the time and uh, uh, happened to run into Robert Harris, who was head of Universal. Uh, a screening room up in Toronto, and he, I said, "What are you doing up here?" And he said, "Well, we just finished one of the couple of the Hulk movies." And I said, "What?" Yeah, yeah. Bill and uh, and uh, one of my former producer writers, Nick Correa, uh, had sort of got put their heads together, and I guess decided they wanted to do it. And I guess Bill wanted to direct as well, 
Uh, and uh, so it was fine. It was always odd. I thought that they hadn't even called me to say, hey, we're going to do this, by the way. Uh, and uh, and it was something it was it's interesting, too, because I've never seen any of them. Uh, but and it was something Bill and I never talked about, although we were close until the day he died. Uh, but it just it was a subject that just sort of never came up. I think it was a little embarrassment on their part for having you know not checked in. I heard they were very different and not quite the same quality as what we'd been doing in the series. But uh, uh, but you know no grudge. I mean it was I was glad that the guys were working and and making some extra money. But um, as far as the the uh, the uh, cancellation. It was uh, a stupid move by a man who uh, was only for a short time uh, uh, the president of CBS um, because uh, he uh, the show was still in the top 15 or 20 when he, he said, no, I don't think I want to pick it up for another season. And I said, uh, his name was Harvey. And I said, but Harvey, we already have six episodes in the can for next season. I said, if you have concerns about it not being successful any longer, which I disagree with, they're already there, you know, and you buy, what, seven more, and there's 13 weeks of, of episodes, a half a season, and if it's still going along and people are liking it like they are already right now, uh, then you're in, 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 and I said, and not only that, let me tell you the opening series, the opening show that I would like to do for, for the fifth season. I said, uh, we have established that uh, that Bix had a sister uh, in the show uh, whom he, he he encountered once, maybe twice in, in the episodes that we did. And I said, the sister discovers that she is dying. And the only thing that might be able to save her is uh, an infusion of blood from a sibling. And this puts our hero in a real difficult position because he wants to save his sister, and yet what happens when Hulk blood gets into his sister? And I said, and what I will give you is not some kind of comic booky bra popping She-Hulk stuff, but I'll give you a woman that is that we love, that it is becomes incredibly dangerous and scary, and it will be a two two hour opening two parter that will take everybody's head off. And uh, and then we'll slide on in and do the, the air the episodes that we've already made plus more that we that can do. And he said, "No, nah, I don't think I want to do that." <laughs> so uh, uh, it was a huge mistake. And uh, as I said, he was only a, the president of CBS for a very short time. It was only one of many mistakes that he made. But that was a major one, and and we were all disappointed. Uh, I was too, particularly because I would always like to have tried to figure out how I would have done a, a last episode of the series. Uh, and, you know, was my idea, my plan had always been to try to do it as a, a show that brought a psychological conclusion in a, in a good way to our hero who had been on this really difficult quest for, uh, for five years. Uh, but, we never had time to fa even fashion a story or carry it into any sort of script or anything like that, just because uh, they pulled the plug too soon. And it was disappointing. It's a terrible shame. It is. Yeah. It would have been lovely to see some sort of natural conclusion to it, you know. That's what um, I, that's what I felt, and I felt that it would be good for the audience, and uh, uh, and it was not going to hurt the show in syndication because it was, you know, if you know how it's going to end, you know, on you know, but no, come on, it uh, uh, it would have carried on just fine in syndication as it did. It was released. Uh, my my original pilot, you know, was released overseas as a as a theatrical motion picture. Yes, yes, uh, and and became the top grossing motion picture in Europe for a couple of months. I remember when Universal called me and said, "You have the top grossing movie in Europe." I said, "I do." When did <laughs> I? <laughs> you know? And then the yeah. the uh, and then the uh, the married episode, the one that Marriott Hartley won the Emmy for for best actress, that I also wrote and directed. They released that in Europe as not my title, The Bride of the Incredible Hulk. And, yes. Yeah, and it, it, and it made a pot full of money over there for for Universal. I didn't get much of it, but uh, uh -huh. um, it was it was exciting to see that uh, it had just been so successful and uh, and people you know loved the show and what we were doing. Yeah, um, I've got the final comment from the the fans here. 
um, before we get on to the other things you've been doing, uh, you, you're, you, you, were, you created or are involved with um, Kenny. PJ Tech Tour, I hope I'm spelling that man's name right, or or, or, or lady's name, I'm not sure. Uh, he just wanted to say a thank you to you. He mm-hmm. said, thank you for bringing us The Incredible Hulk uh, to television. If this group shows uh, shown us anything at all, it would be our love for, for Lou, Bill, and uh, the great decades of entertainment that the show brought us. Um, and uh, uh, if uh, had it had it stayed on in comic form, without your vision, we wouldn't have had the, you know such a great program. So thank you on behalf of us all. Well, that's uh, thank you, TJ. I, I I am flattered and I'm honored and and uh, and I have to share the credit with uh, a whole lot of people, uh, not just with uh, with Bix and Lou and and Jack Colvin and our brilliant actors that we had, but the team that we had and the family that we had on that show. I was just yesterday delivering a eulogy for Tom Reba, who was our special effects guru on the Hulk and and later did. Uh, um, V with me, and then went on to do huge, huge movies like uh, Harrison Ford's The Fugitive, that big train wreck at the beginning of that movie. Mm. It's all Tommy Reba. Uh, he worked with Ronnie Howard and did all of the firework in in Backdraft, which was some of the most poetic, awesome. amazing pyrotechnic work on that. Oh, wow. Amazing work. Yeah. Yeah, and Tommy was was gem, and as was everybody on the crew. It was a real family crew. We all loved each other and worked together for years. The whole Hulk crew and followed me right to Warner's from Warner from Universal. We, they came to Warner's with me and they, they were the guys that jumped and men and women that jumped on to V and, uh, uh, and helped me make that original four hour miniseries. Um, and then my editors, uh, one of them, Alan is an English guy named Alan, Alan Marks. Um, as a matter of fact, in the pilot movie, Elena Marx was the character that Susan Sullivan played, and uh, that was based on Alan's name. You know, uh, and Alan, bless his heart, is 98 years old. I'm still going to see him for Thanksgiving this year, and uh, and and Alan, from the day I met him on the Bionic Woman in 1975. If you if you came up to Alan and said, How are you today, Alan? He'd say, Fantastic. And he still says the same thing at 98. And uh, you know, and and he and I are, are hanging on. But but it was all of those people and the writers and the producers and the directors that worked with me, like Alan and Jim Parriott and Nick Correa and uh, Karen Harris and Jill Sherman, who wrote one of their very first scripts for me and and then slowly became up, went up the ladder. I brought them up with me until they were finally producing the Hulk, but the last couple of seasons, and um, uh, and all of those people working together are are what made what you have enjoyed, uh, and and, uh, and it's it's, um, it's wonderful to you know when people realize that, and and I just always want to make you know share the uh, the the glory as it is with all of my friends. That's what you can see actually up here behind me. Uh, this is my office in in, uh, in Sherman Oaks. I see some photos of the, of the yeah, programs some, behind yeah. you there, uh, Kenny. Yeah, some, some photos. My whole career. Lots of photos. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, wow, goes all, all the way up. Yeah. Yeah, it goes all the way out. Yeah, as I said, there's a second, there's a third floor. We've got you know a lot of a lot of pictures, and I, I uh, and and most all of them are of me and people like Tommy Reba, you know, people like Bill Bixby, people like Ricky Gunter, our camera operator, like John McPherson, my cinematographer, who was so brilliant and so neurotic and crazy, but also such an artist, uh, and so many many people that I worked with over the years. Werner Kepler, who created the original Hulk head for me, and went on to work in Alien Nation with me and won an Emmy in that, uh, uh, working with us too. Uh, so the, the the family has hung together for you know for a long time. It's been really rewarding, really rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, so speaking of V, uh, the series V. Uh, um, which starred at the time, I don't, and I don't think he was that well known at the time. Was Robert England, who of course <laughs> went on later on to be like this iconic horror figure, of, you know, in the Nightmare on Elm Street films as Freddy Krueger. Um, mm. What's your memories of create well creating V and working on it, uh, uh, Kenny? 
What can you tell us about that time? Well, I understand whole... <laughs> also that you are working on something to try and bring it back. I believe. Yes, there, there's yeah. all of that. Uh, that's a whole separate show, Frank. Yeah. The, whole, yeah. the, whole, the whole thing, the whole V story. But but it's funny. Uh, uh, the uh, Billy Boyd and Dom uh, uh, from the, who are the two hobbits from uh, Lord, Lord of the Rings. Oh yes. They, they have they have a podcast they do called the Friendship Onion. And uh, and Susie, my wife, is a particularly a big fan of it. Uh, and and she called me. Then she said, "Hey, you got to come in and look at this." And uh, uh, Robert England was on their show. This was just last week, talking about V and uh, uh, talking about Freddie and all of that. And he said, "Yeah, Freddie was was important, but the thing that really launched me was V." And uh, and he he said, and it was a. a and I remember he called me, Fred, uh, Robert did, when he was out doing uh, public appearances for Freddy versus Jason. And um, uh, and they had these press conferences for him, you know, and, and and he said, Kenny, it was kind of embarrassing for the people that had produced Freddy versus Jason, because all the people wanted to ask about were questions about v Willie and V, you know. And at one point, the guy that was running the thing said, well, OK, now that's fine. But does anybody have any questions that are not about Willie and V? And all the hands went down, you know, and Bob said it was like, oops. you know. But when he was on the Friendship Onion uh, a, a week or so ago, he was talking about when he came in to audition for me. And uh, and all of those days are a blur because uh, we were running so fast to cast and get the show start shooting. I mean, normally when you do a four-hour miniseries, uh, Frank, you'd have four months or five months to prep before you started filming. You know, and uh, when we did V, uh, from the day that Brandon Tartikoff said go, until the day I said it read my script and said go, till the day I said action, was two and a half weeks. That was all the prep time we had before we could start shooting. And because he needed it for the the sweeps uh, in, in in February, uh, and uh, and the NBC was in the toilet, and he was desperate to have something big and splashy like V, and that's what he wanted. And so we didn't have any. And I was had to cast sixty five speaking roles while I was also location scouting or arranging the visual effects, getting the spacecraft designed. All you know, and um, so the, the the audition period of every is a blur. But but when but Robert reminded me about it when he was talking to the guys at the Friendship Onion, uh, to Dom and Billy, he said, yeah, he said it was weird. I went in to audition for Kenny and he said, I didn't know, and I told him, he said, Kenny, I don't know what to do with this. I said, you give me a cane or a mustache or something or a mask, I can make a character out of it, you know? But I mean, here I am, I'm an alien who's never been to the earth before. They taught me Arabic and I don't, so I don't speak English well and I'm, I'm just lost and, and, uh, uh, and he said, and the, the great thing was that Kenny just said two words to me. And I'm sitting at, well, I'm watching this now and, and, and thinking, oh my God, what, what in the world? I said two words and that gave him the whole character. And, and, but that's what he's telling these guys. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there totally attentive, trying to figure out what magical pearls of directorial wisdom I had instantly come up with and condensed into two words, you know? And, and he said the two words were Gene Wilder. And I thought, oh, that's embarrassing. I actually suggested to an actor that he, you know, do a, you know, and I, then I realized, oh, no, because what Robert said was that I, I immediately understood what he was talking about. Don't play it like Gene Wilder would play it. But Gene always had that, that sort of naivete and that innocence and that uh, lack of self-confidence and that vulnerability and, you know, uh, and all of that. And Robert said, just hearing those two words from Kenny, he said, gave me the whole character. He said, I had it. And, uh, and that's what we did. And, uh, uh, and he was absolutely in the moment every time, every moment we were filming and has remained a close friend uh, over all these uh, for almost 40 years now. And um, uh, but but he still gets he there's even a, a piece that he did on uh, I think it was on MTV where a girl is coming to see his uh, he's playing like the, the suave guy who's, you know, trying to get this young woman interested in him. And come on in and I'll show you all my Freddy Krueger stuff. And she says, yeah, but what about Willie? Tell me about Willie. 
<laughs> and he just has this big temper tantrum. Like, doesn't anybody remember anything but Willie? <laughs> you know? But it's uh, it was it was it was really great, and we had a had a wonderful time. So, and listen, before we go run away I, I, and finish up, I, I I did want to mention, and you did, the fact that I do have a new novel out now, uh, which is uh, is kind of fun. It is uh, here's the here it is. Uh, it's called Holmes Coming, as in the guy who was known as Sherlock Holmes, and how he suddenly appears in the 21st century, in as you can see in San Francisco, and and he's still the the I, I've always had a fondness for larger than life characters. I guess that's obvious, uh, uh, Frank, and and a, and a surprising amount of success with them, and uh, and also a fondness for the 19th century writers, uh, 18th century writers, like no, 19th century, 1800s, like Victor Hugo, Robert Louis Stevenson, those, and and Conan Doyle. And I was reading a this Conan Doyle story uh, a few years ago, and I thought. Wow, wouldn't it be? They've, everybody's done Sherlock Holmes one way or another, and it's been done and done and done and done and done. Uh, but but what they nobody would ever done was to take the original character that Conan Doyle had created and bring him up into the present day to see how he would react. Uh, and so I just decided that not unlike the Bionic Woman, uh, he had been able to hibernate himself because he was a master chemist. And uh, and he has taken a step into and hibernated himself in 1899 and wakes up in 2022. Uh, and he's still the same eccentric, egocentric, cocaine addicted, sexist genius. But now he's 100 years out of sync. And so his deductions, while they're still brilliant, are sometimes just a little wrong because of the fact that he's in a different place at a different time. Uh, and he finds himself... Um, beholden to the woman who saved his life, who is a, uh, a doctor who tells the story like Dr. Watson did, except that she's female and he has trouble with getting around. A female doctor, really, <laughs> you know? And, and so there's a lot of, the, of that in it. And, uh, and of course, uh, Moriarty finds a way to rear his head in it, his arch nemesis and uh, descendants uh, get into the picture. And it's a it's a, a comedic mystery with a lot of suspense and a lot of uh, fish out of water humor, uh, and uh, and it's um, uh, the the early reviews I must say have been wonderful and so far all the reader reviews that have come in uh, uh, have been super. So it's available at you can go to I do have a website which is Kenneth Johnson just one word Kenneth Johnson dot us, um, and then I have a Facebook page which is Kenneth Johnson author, A-U-T-H-O-R, author. Uh, and you can find out more about the book there or just go to Amazon and click on Homes Coming and um, you can find it. Excellent. That's really brilliant. Thanks for that, Kenny. I'm sure people will be interested in that. So yeah, do check out those sites and um, and uh, if you like that, you know, please pur purchase the book. And you've got other book, a couple of other books as well, haven't you, Kenny? Well, yeah, I do. If you go to my, if you go to my site, uh, yeah, I, I, I was lucky enough to, I've, I've done one recently before Holmes called the Darwin Variant, which is uh, a, a bit of a more science fictiony piece, and the one before that was actually it became a bestseller. It's called The Man of Legends, about a man who brought down a curse upon himself. There's a little bit of Hulk in it. Uh, uh, it's about a man who brought down a curse upon himself two thousand years ago. And uh, and he cannot die. He goes through the pain of death, but he always manages to heal. And and he can't stay in the same place for more than three days at a time. And he has to move on. So he's been on a quest for the last two thousand years to try to uh, uh, find a cure for or, or find out what the reason is that he has been that this was brought down upon him and. Uh, uh, and the way that he has, when the publisher, uh, that was an, actually an Amazon book, um, when the, the publisher first heard the story, they said, oh, this is great. This is like, the, and he's being pursued by the Vatican. So it's like the, the, uh, the, the um, uh, it's kind of gone right out of my head. Um, the, 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 uh, uh, it's the Vatican kind of thing that's, that has lasted. The, the, the Tom, the Tom Hanks made the movie of, and, um, um, and 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 also another movie, 
uh, Forrest Gump. It's a sort of a combination of Forrest Gump and the Da Vinci Code. That's what was not coming out. It was a sort of a combination of the Da Vinci Code meets Forrest Gump. And I said, what are you talking about? This is a really deep seated drama, you know, the man of legends. And they said, yeah, but he changes history as he goes along, which is true because Forrest Gump affected history in the 20th century. My guy has affected key points in history for 20 centuries and changed the course of humanity many, many times. And, and sometimes not for, the, not for good. Sometimes all good deeds go on, but no good deeds go unpunished, you know. But um, uh, it's a, it was it became a bestseller and, and had been for several years on, on Amazon, and it's still available too. But uh, and and Frank, I would love to talk to you more about V and uh, uh, and, and Alien Nation, perhaps down the road sometime too. Uh, I can't go to do it today, but uh, uh, there are a lot of stories. Just quickly, I will say yes. We are endeavoring to, to do a theatrical remake of my original miniseries, which would be followed by two sequel movies based on my novel, V, the Second Generation, which picked up the story 20 years later to see what had become of the world. And, uh, uh, and so we're, we're, we've had it set up a couple of times. And then for some reason, when, when it came to sign the check, there was no ink in the pen. You know, it was like... Uh, and uh, uh, and the last time uh, was uh, was really a trial because uh, uh, this billionaire pharmaceutical billionaire uh, decided he wanted to be in the movies and he bought the Desi Lu Studios name and uh, as the old Desi Desi Arnaz Lucille Ball Studios uh, and was going to make V his flagship uh, movie and we actually got a big chunk of change out of him to uh, to option the property. And we started location scouting and uh, uh, visual effects and all of that. And then the Hollywood Reporter did a little expose that the guy was really a sham. And he was only using V to try to get people to invest in his company, which was a non-company. There was no there there. You know? And it was like, yeah, and he's facing 20 years in prison for wire fraud and mail fraud. And it's like, uh, so it was very frustrating, but we have not uh, given up. And um, uh, my producing partners and I are still uh, trying to get movie on the big screen and not a reimagination of V, like people tried to reimagine the bionic woman or reimagine V or reimagine the incredible Incredible Hulk and it didn't work uh, very well the first few times for sure. So I've uh, determined to hang on to the rights until uh, I either get it made the right way or it won't get made. But I don't want to see it get made wrong by the wrong people. I completely get that. Yeah, yeah. I, see, I could totally understand that, Kenny. Well, it's been great speaking with you, seriously. And thank you so much for taking more time than we had planned. It's very, very kind of you to go through all these questions with me. Uh, and uh, was, I hope we can ca my... catch up with each other again some point, can you elaborate on V and so on if you want to? That would be great. And and thanks to the folks that did write in with some questions for you to pass along to me. And uh, uh, and the, the, it's easy and fun to talk about shows that I've had so much fun doing and have all been a gift to me to be able to do them. Uh, and when I know and, and I'm able to speak directly one on one with the people who write me all the time and I try to answer every email that I get. Uh, it's like really being in touch with your audience and uh, and I hope to be forever and, and I am forever grateful to the audience and the people out there who have seen my stuff and read my books and uh, uh, and seem to like what I've done and I'm, 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 I'm humbled by it all. Thank you so much again, Frank. You're very welcome, Kenny. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll leave, when, when the video is out of this, I'll leave the links for your um, website and so on, on in the description underneath the video. Absolutely. That'll so people great. can check it out to their heart's desire. And okay. in the meantime, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you again, Kenny. And um, until next time, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.